So good morning, everybody. And thanks that you all be here so early in the morning. Uh, are you here again? Good. Um, I'm really grateful that I can actually explain what I'm doing in front of you because you are actually the ones who are sort of supporting this research. And I think that's really, really cool. Um, uh, a ve very, very cool opportunity for me. So before I want to start into this uh, topic, which is called autophagy involvement in BIPA, and which I will explain in more detail later, I actually brought this screw here all the way from the Netherlands, from Europe to here, because I, I think it's important because we are here in, I'm working in a fundamental research lab, in a basic research lab, and I want to explain why, why this is actually important, why I think it's important also when we talk about a disease so I imagine ourselves as, as sort of fundamental researchers, as some sort of mechanics in a garage. And when then someone is coming with a broken car actually towards the mechanics and say, hey, look, my car is not working properly anymore. And I'm pretty sure it's because of this screw, because I found this screw underneath my car this morning, and this is not supposed to be there. So can you fix it? Now, the, the, me the mechanic would probably say, Yes, I can, but before I can fix it, I first have to figure out actually what is going wrong with this, where this screw has actually, where does it belong to this screw? So then, only then I can start fixing your car. And that's basically what I see how B-Pan is. We have something that is not working in our body, and we actually know the screw because we know our, double, uh, our gene that is mutated, WD45. But what we don't know is, unfortunately, what this gene is actually doing in the cell. So, and before we don't know what this gene is doing in the cell, we cannot actually fix what is wrong in a, uh, in a sort of sustainable way. And that's why I think basic research is really important also to find out what is actually going wrong. And then we can start fixing it. So, now. so can I not, can I do this? Ah, yeah, thanks. So, what I want to tell you now in the, in the next couple of minutes is basically why I think autophagy might be involved in, in BPAN and in the, in the problem with BPAN. And just for quickly, for the structure, I will just talk about a little bit about what is actually the gene and the protein WD45, and then what is autophagy, and in the end, a little bit, what are we doing actually in the, in the lab. So, in BPAN, we know that the gene that is causing the mutation is WD45. So there is a mutation, it lays on the X chromosome. And when I started this research, I found BPAN, when I looked at the name, Beta Propeller Protein Associated Neurodegeneration, I thought it's a very complicated name. But in fact, actually, I think it's pretty self-explanatory when you, when you know what it means. So neurodegeneration, when you look at this word, you know it has something to do with the brain, with our brain. Something is not correct in our brain. And beta propeller protein, it's actually when you look at how the WD45 looks like, when you really zoom in in this protein, you can see that it, you see with these numbers, one to seven, it's, it resembles actually a little bit like a propeller. And then when the first researcher discovered this protein and saw how it looks like, they thought, well, it actually looks like a propeller from an airplane. So we call it propeller protein. And this beta comes from actually when you look even closer to the structure, you see these arrows. This means that this is actually a beta sheet. And therefore, we have the name beta propeller protein. And since it's, it's uh, damaged in, in BPAN, it's called beta propeller social neurodegeneration. And what I found interesting, when you look now in we, we did it in 2018, look at all the, all the mutations that were publicly available, so that causes BPAN. And when we did that, you see with all these stripes marked, uh, you see now the propeller linearized in the same color code, and you see that the, the mutations that are actually causing BPAN are all over the whole gene. It's not that it's just one, one particular position that is mutated, or even not even one hotspot, it's really all over the protein. So, this means that there is a lot of variety of different mutations in, in BPAN that causes actually the same, uh, the same disease. So I will come to that to WD45 later. Now I'm switched to autophagy, what it is. So when you, when you would read the first sentence in autophagy, it's an intracellular pathway. And what it means is that 
and our body basically is organized in organs. We have the brain, we have the liver, we have the heart and the skin. And these, these organs are actually all consist of cells. This is basically it's the smallest component of our body, the cells. And autophagy takes place in these cells. So it's not taking place in the blood or in the saliva or somewhere else, it's really in the cells. But when you would come now to our laboratory and, and look uh, in where, when, where we're daily working with, it's not like that we have pieces of skin or liver somewhere on our desk and our yeah, bench. It's basically when you would come in our laboratory, open the incubator where we, where we grow our cells, you would just see something like that, which is in principle just plastic dishes with a le red liquid. And, but the, on these plastic dishes, the cells are growing, and the red liquid is basically just the, the, the fuel and the nutrition that the cells need to grow. And with the eye, you would not see anything else. So therefore, we have actually always like microscopes everywhere to sort of zoom in what, what, we, what we don't see with the eye. And then you see this. This is what we basically daily see. These are the cells. So these triangular structures that you see a bit surrounded with a, with a, white, with, with a white arrow, uh, with a right lane border, these are the cells. And within these cells, autophagy takes place. And what autophagy is, it comes actually from, from the Greek, and it means the first part is auto, means self, and the second part is from phagein, means to eat, so self-eating. But it's not like that autophagy is eating up its entire cell or even other cells. It's basically when you think of autophagy, I would like to think uh, to, that you think about two images actually. First one on the left side is actually a vacuum cleaner because this is what autophagy does. It vacuum cleans your cells. So every garbage that is laying around in the cell, it just gets uh, vacuum cleaned by autophagy. But then it's not throwing away everything that is actually in the vacuum cleaner. It will not get thrown away. It actually gets recycled. So that's the second image that is important, so the cycling. So because we don't throw anything away in the cell, it's way too precious, so we just reuse it. And when you now think that of these two, these two pictures, the cleaning up and the recycling, thereby autophagy plays really an important role in, in, in body functions, like it prevents aging and it uh, prevents tumor growth. And also when, when the cells are, or when the body is sort of uh, sick, so when bacteria or pathogens enter the body, then autophagy plays a role in, in fighting them actually. And even for sort of the development, so, so for the right shaping of organs and cells, it takes a, a important role. So therefore when autophagy is not working properly, you can imagine that it really contributes to a lot of different diseases. So, in summary, what, what I think what autophagy is basically is doing when you have like a, a room full of toys, what I think most of us know, and you can imagine if you want to go from one corner to the other corner in such a messy room, you have to go step over the toys, you have to do detours, and when you're like barefoot step on a Lego brick, you know what it feels. So, and it's the same in the cell. When it's such a messy cell, it cannot work properly, actually, because it's, it's just hindered by doing its proper work. So therefore, we do autophagy, or the cell does autophagy, and cleans up everything. And thereby, the toys were nicely in the cupboard again. It can be reused. But actually, we can really properly wo uh, walk in this, in this room and do actually in a, in, a, in a nice, rapid way what we need to do. And it's the same what the cell does. But when we now look, of course, go in more detail, in a, in, in a cell there is no vacuum cleaner. So when you would look at the textbook, you would see a scheme like that. And you see with these dotted lines, this is the cell. So it's important, again, that the autophagy happens within one cell. And in the middle of this whole scheme, it's these, these two round, sort of these two circles, which is actually a ball, a vesicle, and it's called autophagosome. And this is, and this is in principle, the name giving to the whole process. And what happened actually in the cell is there is like garbage that the cell doesn't need anymore, like these shrinkled bottles. And then this balloon is actually forming around these bottles. And we would throw the bottles into an open trash bin and until the trash bin is full. And then we would close it. And that's happened in the cell as well. So the balloon is forming and it actually closes when it's full. And then it thereby 
capture basically all the, uh, all the dirt in the cell and it cannot harm the cell anymore. Nothing else happened so far then. And then what we need to do is actually to bring these, these autophagosomes or trash bins to a recycling uh, place. And this is what also happened in the cell. And then the things that are in this, in this garbage bin get recycled and you can use it for new things to build up, like these bottles. Now, that's all interesting, but what has it to do with BPAM? Now, when you think in the cell, we have these, these proteins in the cell, that's actually the workers or the main players in the cell. And this, this balloon in the cell, it just does not form by itself. So it needs actually proteins that, that help them to do it. And in terms of autophagy, we have the, the proteins that are crucial are called the ATG proteins, autophagy proteins, quite simple. And, and there are roughly 16 that are really essential. It's basically the lineup. It's a soccer pitch, so now you know I'm from Europe. Um, and one of these major, major players actually in the lineup is this WD45. So it actually plays a crucial role in this, in this pathway. The problem is just that it's injured, if you want to be a metaphor, so it's, it's damaged. Now the question is, how much does this damage player influence the whole process? And this is actually, and that's why we think it, that autophagy plays a major role in, or plays a role in BPAN because this, uh, this WD45 is, is sort of damaged in, in BPAN. So again, well, what we're doing now in, the, in, in our lab actually is um, we work in a so-called in, in a laboratory cell line. So this is again the, the picture that you see, these are the cells where we're working with. In the first place, these cells have nothing to do with BPA and they are just normal cells that we, that we constantly use in our, in our laboratory. But what we can do with these cells quite easily, we can actually change these cells. We can, we can delete, so we can erase the WD45 protein, or we can change it and mimic the BPAN uh, mutations that are found. So therefore, we basically mimic a, a BPAN, a cellular BPAN system. And then with these cells, we can measure autophagy. And what we can also do is we can just look at the cells and look what is actually going wrong in these cells. So what are the difference when we compare the, when we compare the deleted cells versus the normal cells, the, non, the, the non-modified cells? And to give you just one, one, one example, what is basically what we found is these are now in green. On the left-hand side, you see the, the normal cells, the non-modified cells. On the right-hand side, the, uh, the WD45 deleted cells. And what we, what we sort of stained, so what we colored in these, in these uh, cells are the, the mitochondria. And these are actually the, the, energy, the energy generating compartments in the cell. And on the left-hand side, when you look closely, you see that these mitochondria, they form as such network structures, so worms or spaghetti, if you want to say. And when you then look closely on the, on the right-hand side, you don't really see these long worms anymore. They are just like these dots all over. So this is actually then give us, this, this showed us that with this, this, the structure and, uh, and the network structure of these, these energy sort of source compartment or these energy compartments in the cells are somehow damaged and, and fragmented. And this was interesting because I told you that uh, in autophagy it's basically um, an overall cleanup of the cell. So it just blindly cleans up everything. But what it can also do and what we know is that it can also basically cherry pick. It can pick things that are damaged in the cells quite specifically. So like mitochondria, like these, these uh, energy building compartments. So then when the one is damaged or not working properly anymore, it gets marked. And this mark is basically recognized by this autophagosome and then bring, bring the, this, this, damaged, this damaged mitochondria to the, to, the recycling, sort of, to the recycling station and really degrades these these damaged mitochondria. So it's not like, it's like if you would just pick up in a, in a garbage, in a, in, a, in, a messy, in a messy room, just a paper, for example. And, and then we call it mitochondria autophagy, short mitophagy. So 
this is in principle why, why, why we think that in, in, in these two situations we have a, an overall cleanup that might be that might not go well in these cells, and we have also specifically because we saw we have these defects in this mitochondria network, that we could also think that here in the specific targeting of these damaged mitochondria there's something wrong. So that's why we what we are now doing and what are we in, in near future that we're doing. We look now at all the forms of autophagy that um, that that occur whether they are all functioning well or not. And then looking at whether the, the VPN associated uh, WD45 mutation, so when we mimic exactly what is, what is happening in patients, whether this influenced, uh, the influenced these processes to a different extent. And since I told you I, we, we use right now, we use just this, this normal uh, laboratory cell line, but we will also go then into really brain cells because in the brain, in the neurons, uh, we think that this uh, that VPN is mostly sort of established. And uh, I do hope that in the near future, some of the mechanics will, I like, shout out, okay, now I found where actually the screw belongs to. And this will probably then help to, to make really uh, sustainable uh, treatment therapies for BPAM. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know for questions, whether we should have questions later on, and, but you can always find me. I'm around the whole day, so when you also want to come later and ask at a picnic, I'm available. So for Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Seo, and she was the recipient of our $150,000 Early Career Researcher Award um, with monies raised by the BPAN families. Thank you so much, and then thank you for the invitation to come today. And then it's my pleasure to be here, you know, as a first in you know, the conference, family conference here. So I'm going to talk about, you know, the, our work about the roles of, you know, Aryan in the BPEN. So, like you know, Mario already introduced, well, the beta propeller protein associated neurodegeneration is called BPEN. So this is one of the relatively recently identified form of neurodegeneration with brain ion accumulation. So it looks like it has a two stage of the disease. The one is in, uh, during the infancy and early childhood. It looks like they have the global development delays. And as well as you know, in the uh, early adulthood, they are showing the uh, progressive dystonia and Parkinsonism and uh, cognitive decline and seizures. So if you look at you know, the MRI images of the brain ion accumulation in the you know, BPEN patient, like other you know, uh, MBI patient, they actually are showing the you know, ion accumulation in the specific brain region we call the substantia nigra in the you know, top panel, and then uh, globus pallidus in the, you know, the lower panel. Not other you know, the brain regions accumulate ion, but uh, only these two specific brain regions showing the you know, ion accumulation in the BPEN patients. So we are interested in why iron is accumulated in these brain regions. So like, you know, Mario already you know, introduced, well, the BPEN is the, you know, uh, the caused by WDL45 gene deficiency. So WDL45, why it is, you know, WDL45 is because of the, it is encoded uh, protein called WD repeat protein. So W is actually amino acid, the code called uh, tryptophan, and then D is actually stands for you know, aspartate. So WD is you know, uh, the tryptophan, aspartate, a lot of them are in this protein, and then repeat protein. So WDL45 is encoded the BPEN. So it is a highly symmetrical seven-bladed beta propeller structure, as showing in here. So that's why the WDL45 deficiency is the cause of the BPEN, and this protein is known to be very optimal for the, you know, the protein-protein uh, interaction. 
So in the BPM patient, this gene is called WDL45, is either mutated or deleted. So this is the cause of the BPM. So now, you know, the Mario actually uh, introduced a little bit about how WDL45 is, you know, uh, involved with autophagy. This is very, you know, complicated cellular process. So I'm going to introduce just a little bit what is known about WDL45 with autophagy. So autophagy is, you know, one of the cellular process, very necessary cellular process. Without it, you know, cell cannot really live well. So we have the unnecessary materials from the cells and they will be engulfed. So in the autophagosome, one of the, uh, the uh, organelles in the cells, and then it is uh, delivered to the lysosome, which is on a garbage can in the cell, and then all the, you know, the un unnecessary materials can be degraded, which means you know, they are gone. So you know, WDL45 for now, what is known about WDL45 in the cell is that they are either in the mitochondria or could be in the ER. But no one is actually showing how they are uh, localizing the cell as well. But what is known is you know, in WDL45 deficiency, which is in the BPEN patient, they actually have the lower autophagy uh, activity. And uh, with you know, the mouse model, only specifically deleted in the uh, neuron, WDL45 neuron specific knockout mice also showing the learning and memory defect, but as well as the lowered autophagy. So this data actually suggests that WDL45 is very critical to the autophagy process, especially in the uh, formation of autophagosome. So now we know how WDL45 is involved within the autophagy, but what about RN? What is known about WDL45 with the RN? So going back to the chemistry, the RN is one of the you know, essential metals. So, so the, we need you know, the RN for our body. And if you look in here, the atomic number in the RN is 26, and the molecular weight is 55. And then they are just in the middle, and then they are actually transition metals. So RN is actually very essential, although we you know, uh, think it is very toxic when we have the excess amount. So how it is essential? Because you know, the, with RN, we need to actually eat them from the diet. Without RN, we cannot live because 70% you know, of our body uh, of the RN is used for the blood production as you know, and then in addition to the blood production, it is also important for oxygen transport and also energy production. So if you think about the brain, our brain is the, among the you know, uh, most metabolically, the active organ in our body. Iron is very essential for the brain function, such as a neurotransmitter, you know, synthesis, and the myelination and energy generation from the mitochondria, oxygen transport, and cellular division. So the RN actual deficiency is the most prevalent dietary nutrition uh, deficiency in the world, affecting 5 billion people. So without RN, people not only become you know, anemic, but also become you know, development uh, disorders. But now we are talking about why RN is so uh, harmful when we have the excess amount. The reason is you know, the RN always exists in the two oxidation states. One is ferrous. Uh, the other is, you know, ferric. So we call the Fe2 plus or 3 plus. Those oxidation state is very important because if they ha we have the uh, excess amount of iron, they can move with the hydrogen peroxide in our body and then produce iron 3 plus and then also free radical. So free radical is you know, a reactive oxygen species we call the ROS, which is a very, very uh, potential and then very harmful non-selective oxidant. So that makes you know uh, our body very rusty. So that those you know uh, free radicals can attack any kind of organs, such as you know DNA. They can actually uh, attack the uh, protein. They can attack the lipid. Lipid is also you know in the cell membrane everywhere. So they, they actually cause an you know, oxidative injury in our body. Then tissues are all damaged by RN. 
So that's why iron is very toxic and then also you know, essential. So we need to really maintain the iron homeostasis in our body and then the system is very developed well. So now we know how WDL45 is, you know, uh, contribute to the you know, autophagy, and uh, WDL45 deficiency also accumulate the iron in the brain. So then my question becomes, what is the you know, relationship between impaired autophagy and then iron accumulation in the brain, and how does it contribute to the neurodegeneration? So to address this question, we are looking at how iron metabolism, homeostasis, is altered in WDL45 deficient BPEN patient, those you know, the cell. So it's more than complicated. I wanted to really make it easier, but let me try with the best. So there are in the cell, looking at the, you are looking at the neuronal cells, and then there are two forms of iron that can be incorporated, get into the cells, which is a, uh, one is transferring bound iron, and then the other form is a non-transferring bound iron. So we call the TBI or NTBI. So usually in our body, in the blood, usually iron is uh, bind to the transferrin. So that is a transferrin bound iron, TBI. So those in a TBI is, is getting into the inner cells through the transferrin receptor. Once you know, the NT, uh, TBI is binding to transferrin receptor, they get endocytos, and they can be used for you know, uh, in our, our cells. But if you have you know, the, all the transferrins is saturated, there are excess amount of iron there can be incorporated into the cell through the NTBI, non-transferring bound iron. So those iron, non-transferring bound iron, is getting into the cell through the different pathway, which is called the DMT1 over there, the divalent metal transporter, or other transporter such as ZIP8 or ZIP14. So there are two forms of iron that can be incorporated into the neuron cells, and then they are all different, you know, um, uh, mediated through the different metatransporters. So they're looking at how the RN in the DB pen is getting to the you know, cells and how they are accumulated. So to look at all the, you know, uh, the mechanism, we first look at the you know, uh, made, uh, made you know, the cell line that actually reduced the expression of the WDR45. So it is a kind of the mimicking of the BPEN pen patient in neuron cells. The, and then we have chosen to use the dopaminergic, the neuron SHSY5 cell. The reason is that the, uh, the iron accumulated in the BPEN, that region is a substantial nigra, and which is a dopaminergic neuron. So with this mouse, uh, the, the cell line, we actually deleted WDR45, so make the you know, WDR45 deficient cells in the neurons. So in this cell line, we first look at how iron is incorporated into the cell. So to look at the you know, transport activity and then those iron uptake, we first look at the TBI, transferring bound iron uptake. So as you see in the, you know, the data, the transferring bound iron 59 uptake, we use the you know, radio acetone, which is the most sensitive the method to detect the you know, iron in the cell. And then sCRNA control or WDL45 deficient cell, they have no difference in this cell line in terms of you know, TBI uptake, which means TBI is not the major form of iron uptake into the cell. And then we next look at the NTBI form. And then with, among the NTBI form, there are two pathways. One is through the DMT1, the other one is through the uh, ZIP8 and 14. And then they were actually working in the different pH. So when we have the neutral pH, 7.4, non-transparent bound iron uptake is mediated through the ZIP8 and ZIP14. So we look at the, those you know, NTBI uptake in the neural cells of BPEN, the first. And then as you see here, there was no difference between uh, control and WDL45 deficient cell. There is no NTBI uptake as a pH 7.4. So indicating that this NTBI mediated through Z beta or Z14 is not the uh, major pathway of the WDL45 deficient cells. So we finally look at the last pathway of the NTBI mediated the iron uptake through the DMT1. 
DMT1, what's special about DMT1 is they only working at very acidic environment like pH 6.7. So we're looking at an NTBI uptake at pH 6.75, and then what we found is compared to the control, there was more iron is taken up by NTBI at pH 6.75 in WDR45 deficient cell. So this data actually is suggesting that WDR45 deficiency, NTBI at pH 6.75 is the major form of the RN uptake in the uh, BPEN patient. So we actually look at another one time point in one hour, NTBI uptake, and then what we found is you know, compared to the uh, pH 7.4, pH 6.75 actually significantly increased are an uptake in BPEN patient cell. So that means this you know, major pathway is going you know, to incorporate or the iron into the neuronal cells. So we next look at the how this, you know, the iron transporter, iron regulatory genes are regulated or altered in BPEN patient cell. So and then what we do is you know, uh, we're looking at the you know, gene expression levels of everything in the neuronal cells. And then what we found in here is the iron uptake is, you know, the DMT1 divalent metal transporter is significantly increased in BPEN patient cell compared to the control. So that means, you know, DMT1 minus IR form without, you know, uh, iron response element is actually the major form of the, you know, uh, the iron uptake pathway into the cell. So what it does means is, you know, transferring bound ion uptake is not really uh, the happening in the, you know, the BPEN patient cell, but non-transferring bound ion through the DMT1 is the major pathway that can, you know, incorporate the ion in BPEN patient cell. So as a result, it probably, uh, it actually indicates if, you know, there is more ion is uptaken up into the neuronal cell in BPEN patient, there should be more iron should be accumulated in the cell as we observed in the, uh, the MRI. So what we do is we actually measure the total iron level in the control and then BPEN patient cell, and then we're looking at the, uh, the iron, total iron levels by ISP mass spec. And then what we found is, you know, compared to the control, WD45 deficient cell actually increased the total iron level as we observed in the BPEN patient. And then what we found is, you know, when we had, they have more iron is treated in the cell, there is a significantly increased iron level in the WD45 deficient cell. We don't know how or why this, you know, the WD45 has more accumulation in the brain. Uh, right now, but we are actually working on it. So, you know, iron is once, you know, get into the cell, we have the total iron is, you know, uh, increased, and then the iron should be actually stored in the uh, iron storage form we call the ferritin. So we look at the you know, ferritin level in the cells, and then, as you see here, the WD45 deficient cell actually has more iron uh, storage form was, you know, synthesized. So, which is, you know, the perfectly makes sense that, you know, iron uptake into the cells are increased, and then the iron, the total iron levels are increased, and then the more iron is actually stored in the, you know, the ferritin, which is the iron storage protein. So what we found, you know, for now is in the Y type actually it should be, should have the TBI, NTBI, ion uptake, you know, should exist. And then they should be available for the cell uh, function and then should be uh, exported out of the cells. However, in the WD45 deficiency, there is not much, you know, TBI uh, ion is uh, taken up, but there is a non-transferring bound ion is uh, taken up into the cells through the DMT1, which is divalent metal transporter, and then once they are get into the cell, they are stored in the ferritin, and then there is not much cells are getting out of the cell. So this is how happen, what happens in the WD45 deficient cell. So this is one of the mechanisms that's showing how WDR45 deficiency accumulate ion in neuronal cells 
and then they were showing that you know, ion transporters are regulated in this process. So probably you may wonder what it does it have to do with you know, the PPM patient you know, or therapeutics. So what we think is you know, uh, instead of just you know, using the you know, uh, non-selective ion chelator or you know, other you know, uh, the treatment, what if we can increase or decrease the ion transporter gene expression in the cell, especially in the neuronal cells, and then they can be uh, uh, developing, we can develop you know, uh, therapeutics you know, out of it. So for example, if we have the DMT1 expression is you know, increased here, we can find you know, a small molecule that can reduce you know, DMT1 ion uptake, or we can increase the ferroportin expression so that you know, more ion can get out of the cell so that there is you know, the less ion stays in the you know, neuronal cells. So th those are you know, our ultimate goals of you know, the, my laboratory. So moving forward, we are currently working on how WD45 uh, impaired their uh, autophagy and then how they accumulate the ion uh, in the neuron and then how they actually increase the neurodegeneration in the cells or you know, the mouse model. We don't have the mouse model you know, yet, but we are trying to get the uh, BPEN mouse model generated, and then we also look at you know, the human BPEN patient in you know, clinical samples if you know, those ion uh, transporters are really altered in this you know, the, uh, patient sample. And then our ultimate goal is to identify the small molecules. We already have you know, uh, several candidate transporter uh, small molecules to reverse the brain ion overload. And then, thank you so much. And then uh, this is my lab. And then this work is done by my uh, PhD student, Louis Sari, and then with the support from the MBIA. And I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, hard to listen. Yeah. That um, in your in your graphs that showed the difference between the pH levels mm -hmm. and determined how much uptake there was with uh, with iron molecules. And the lower the pH level, it showed the increased uptake. And I'm not sure how you did. But I'm doing some type of salute, you know. Um, acidic solution. And if you increase the pH to a more basic or alkalinic state, such as in the human body, you know, maybe through diet or some other way, is there a potential that you can decrease the iron uptake in whatever portion of the body that it is through some other, you know, I guess through diet or changing the body's pH level itself? Oh, I see. So, are you talk, uh, your question is, you know, how the pH level in our body could, you know, change the you know, ion level? Right. So, actually, um, that's a very good question. So, the only that there are uh, so many differences, you know, uh, in the, you know, the ion transporters, especially with, you know, that uh, the divalent trans meta transport DMT1 only works in the a little bit of acidic environment, but other transporters are working at the neutral level. The reason a DMT1 is works in the acidic uh, environment is because of the divalent matter transfer. DMT1 is not only expressed in the brain, also highly expressed in the, you know, our stomach, intestine. So that's why in the stomach is a really acidic environment, right? So it depends on you know, which, which kind of ion transporter that you know, we can kind of look at how they all work in the you know, different pH. But DMT1 is the only one who is working on the very a little bit acidic environment, but if we change the you know, acidity in the you know, the brain, they may break the you know, the other you know, other uh, cellular homeostasis. So it may not be you know, a very great idea to uh, change by changing the you know, uh, the acidity in the you know, brain or you know small molecules. Yeah. Any other questions? I've heard a lot about 
iron once it gets to the brain and differing opinions on is that when potentially regression happens or can you talk at all about, you know, right now our daughter is four and does not have any iron in her brain, but right. to me, obviously a layman, I don't know medical terms very well. I, would, I don't want the iron in the brain, but I've heard that that, that maybe isn't the, the reason why regression would happen. So why iron is in the brain? Or, huh. or is that when the regression happens, or can you talk at all about that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I'm working on the you know, iron in the brain in general. So not only the you know, MBI, the patient, but also aging brain, or the brain uh, with uh, Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease, neurodegenerative disease actually accumulate a lot of iron in the brain. So the, my target is actually how we can reverse the brain iron overload to treat the you know, neurodegeneration, including the MBIA. So I don't know why that happens, but my uh, hypothesis is because you know, once we have the iron from the diet, diet is the only source we can get the iron. Once we get an iron in our body, what's very intriguing about the iron is iron is never excreted out of the body. Iron is always circulating through the red blood cell. So iron is always needed in our body and then recycled. However, when they have you know, some, you know, for the MBIA, especially VPN, probably the WDR45 is deficient that uh, the gene is not really function well. So that's why some of the iron homeostasis has been altered. And then that is accumulating the, you know, the brain. Other neurodegenerative disease also in you know, the um, kind of the similar pathway, but it is as a consequence of you know, iron dysregulation or iron the dyshomeostasis actually caused you know, iron accumulation in the brain. The reason, you know, the brain regions, the substantial nigra or the globus pollicis accumulate a lot of iron is because of the, in general, that area has already have the, a lot of iron is needed. And then those iron, as I said, you know, iron is also needed for the brain function, but actually some of the you know, defect in the gene, the gene or uh, the iron is more accumulating than the brain. So if you look at not only the BPEN, but also the PCAN and PEN patient, they also accumulate the same reason, similar reason, not the other, you know, the brain reasons accumulate the iron. And the iron is also, you know, across the blood-brain barrier very well, and then it actually should be used for the brain function, but at the same time, some of the, you know, the gene defect can cause, you know, iron accumulation in the brain in that specific area. So we are kind of targeting the, you know, how those specific areas of the iron could be reduced or chelated. So that's you know, the, uh, what we are hoping for you know, to develop you know, therapeutics. Thank you so much for your uh, thorough explanation. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess my question somewhat piggybacks on the last uh, parent. Iron dyshomeostasis. Um, before the iron accumulation, what kind of impact can that have on, you know, uh, cellular function, respiratory function? Um, you talked about uh, GI, where it is absorbed and uptake. Um, can you speak to that? So other, uh, other than your brain, what could have happened? Or is that, what's your question? Yes. Uh, yeah, other than brain. Yes, as a patient community, um, you know, we're constantly tracking different subsets of information. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, whenever I see like respiratory infection coming up again mm -hmm, and again, mm -hmm. I can't help question. Right, right. So, uh, so within our Aryan, actually, I started this work. Uh, because you know, I was working on the hemochromatosis. Probably you guys probably know that hemochromatosis. The hemochromatosis, you know, excess yes. iron, mm -hmm. right, in your body. So like I said, you know, the iron, once you know, get into the, in our body, it doesn't really go out. And then the hemochromatosis is actually caused by our uh, different genes, such as HFE or fer ferroportin. So those, you know, iron transporter or regulatory genes are when they have the deficient, that cause the excess of iron in the uh, body, 
in systemic level. So the blood iron level is really high, and then they actually accumulate in the liver. So because of the I actually is, uh, said in you know, the Finton reaction that caused the free radical that exactly happens in the you know, liver. So they actually accumulate in the liver. In the liver actually has a damage, and then they actually cause the thrombosis, and uh, it could have become a you know, um, liver cancer as well. But I don't see that MBI patient has you know a lot of iron accumulation in the liver. But I think you know, what comes with you know, iron accumulation in the body, probably you have seen the you know, respiratory the, uh, the infection thing, is because I mean, the iron is required for all living organisms, not only the human, but also uh, the, the pathogen, microorganisms need the iron. So they are actually fighting for the iron. If they have, we have a lot of iron in our body, the uh, virus and the pathogen loves iron, so there is more chance to be infected by you know, the virus. That's what I have known. So I'm Sue, hi everyone. If I may add to the answer, as far as we know, we don't see any other tissue iron abnormality or brain iron, sorry, blood iron abnormality in, other, in all the MBIA except for brain. And there's like one minor exception, astral plasminemia patients show mild anemia. But all the other MBIAs we know, no, other tissues are just fine. Yeah, that's what I have you know, kind of uh, explained in the beginning, that uh, there is no uh, the iron accumulation in the, uh, the rest of the organs other than you know, the brain. That's what I have seen. Yeah. All right. Thank you very uh -huh. much. Uh, next, we have Sue Young Jung, and she uh, spent a lot of her career at the NIH after getting her doctorate and is now in the OHSU lab and is going to talk to us a little bit about some of the work happening there. Hi, everyone. Um, okay. We'll let it turn it off. Um, I'm Sue. I know some of you who came to OHSU, um, I think, two, three years ago, or it's first time at the patient meeting, so this room is really echoey. Come on. Um, I'm a PhD in neuroscience. I studied iron in brain in mouse, different mouse models throughout my PhD degree and also my postdoctoral training. Now, after the postdoctoral training, I wanted something clinical that I don't have to work all the time with mice. So I moved to Susan's lab at OHSU and been working on five or six subtypes of MBIA, and it's just been awesome time. We're mostly focusing on PCAN and BPAN, as you know, but we also work on MePAN and PAN. If you ask Susan, it will just grow and grow and grow. We're still looking for the new gene, too. Um, I don't have presentation today, so you don't have to worry about what is the DMT1, what is TFR1, what is that alphabet up there right now? So I'm just talking to you as a person, a researcher, and I just want to talk to you about what we do uh, through the sampling, through the B-Pen Ready. So some of you are registering to B-Pen, thank you so much. And I know you're getting like constant email and requests about, please send the blood sample, please send the blood sample, this is a return address, this is a quest contact, Please draw the blood. And the reason being that we're trying to, and all those blood tubes come to me, by the way. I'm the one who's handling all those blood tubes. And we're looking for what can we measure through the BPEN patient's blood sample. We're looking for something that we can measure, that we can put our finger on, whether the disease is getting good or bad, or whether this person will progress rapidly or this person will fit into the slow progression disease group. So we can get some idea about how this, this disease is going on. Of course, we cannot go into brain. It's just impossible. So we want to have something accessible and something measurable so we can actually apply that back to this called stupid disease called VPAN. Um, the reason the VPAN requires constant blood drawing, and I cannot recall whether it's three months or six months or a year that we're gonna ask you to repeat it, 
is that BPAN is an ever-changing disease. You've heard Allison's description about excellent mosaicism, um, excuse me, excellent inactivation and mosaicism, that we don't know whether this marker in blood is constantly changing because of those um, complicated genetic factors. And we do want to follow that through the timeline, how this marker is moving and how we can apply back to BPN disease. All right, um, that's really what I have to say. And um, again, I appreciate everybody who's coming to BPN Ready. Don't worry, I'll take the questions. Um, and constantly offering samples. I know, I mean, I've seen BPAN kids getting poked with the blood needle. I think there is a kid who's running away every time she sees me. She go, calls me like, oh yeah, oh yeah. And she runs away from our team. And the skin samples, we had like screaming baby holding, Susan was trying to skin sample her. But that becomes our material, things to look into. How can we tackle this disease? How can we overcome and what things we can measure from? So uh, we really appreciate with all our heart you guys are the power. Thank you. I'll take questions. Hey. <clears throat> Hello. Um, with our community of BPAN families um, ever growing, we have new families coming to our group every week. Um, is there going to be a, a BPAN ready that might be translated into other languages? Um, and I don't know, maybe you guys have already done that, but I was just interested to know so that we could get more global participants. So I'm uh, Penny Hogarth um, from OHSU. I think I was in front of many of you yesterday, so maybe Sue and I can do pieces of this together, stick around at least. Um, so as Sue said, BPAN Ready has been going on for a while. Um, to answer the question, there is absolutely a plan to translate into other languages. Um, we have been approached by people in other parts of the world, and where people have um, sufficient English translation available to them, we are um, allowing them to come into or encouraging them to come into BPAN Ready with, um, we, we sort of handle their data a little differently because as you may know, when you give a questionnaire to somebody who is then having it translated, it calls into question the validity of that questionnaire, whether it's um, truly getting the accurate answers you think it's getting. So it is always better to have it um, be a questionnaire that was either developed in the original language or developed in one language, and then there's a whole process to do forwards and backwards translation to make sure that it is valid. There's also very big cultural differences in, um, from one country to another. You can imagine some of the questionnaires that work well in a first world country like the US may not work so well in a third world country. And so we, um, there are really, really big challenges to doing that, but we are committed um, I think we will try to roll that out probably um, in Spanish languages and in um, uh, Dutch, partly because some of the tools have already been translated into Dutch and because there is a very active um, family community kind of waiting for that in, in the Netherlands. Um, there's motivated people to help us um, make that happen. Um, we are uh, fortunate that uh, English is a, a, a language, is the most commonly spoken language around the world, and um, so it is, um, depending if you count by numbers of people or not, but, but it is a, a sort of an accepted language. There are many, many more people in Europe who are truly fluent in English than uh, are fluent in Dutch and <laughs> many uh, the, the other way around, and so we're um, we're trying to sort of refine what we're doing in English and then figure out how to roll it out into other countries. So that's kind of a long-winded answer, but the answer is yes, we're committed to it. 
Hi, good morning. Good morning. I just had a question in regards to the samples that are shared. Like, how are they shared with other institutions and other mm -hmm. partners that you're collaborating with? And then the second question is, how are, how are the parents and the families being requested for the samples? Is it just Yeah, so it's a little bit of a moving target. So let me tell you what we planned in BPAN Ready. So we started BPAN Ready with funding from NBIA Disorders Association. Thank you. <laughs> and then we had some additional funding from the Million Dollar Bike Ride um, to, for um, some analysis, which is gonna happen in the coming year uh, to sort of look at the feasibility of what we're doing using this same approach that we've used in PCAN, a statistical approach that's called latent growth curve analysis, which I can talk a little bit more about if anybody's interested. The sampling was always an intrinsic part of our natural history study plan to establish a biorepository, to do that in a systematic way that could then tie those samples where people wanted to, to natural history data, to collect them over time from, from individuals, including um, what we would call unbiased samples, where we don't have a specific analysis plan for the blood that's coming in the door, but rather we are processing it and storing it under optimal conditions so that as new tools come along, that blood is um, appropriately um, curated and tied to a data set and stored under optimal conditions. The challenges of getting samples from people who are geographically dispersed and um, having them handled optimally, getting them to us quickly so that we can have good quality samples uh, was a little greater than we expected. And it also limits the number of samples that we can collect. You can't do skin biopsies uh, easily on someone who's on the other side of the country and know that they will be handled optimally. Um, so we have reserved, so we, we negotiated um, a contract with Quest, and it was always our explicit plan to roll out the sampling in the second year of the study so that we, we hope to do it, you know, after nine months of data collection, but it actually wound up taking a bit longer than that. The contract with Quest is negotiated. We chose Quest because they responded to our phone calls and they have centers in most areas of the country. There are some people who don't have a Quest site near them and uh, we will make other arrangements with local providers or local laboratories in those cases. So those of you that are in BPAN Ready may not have had um, a, a sort of a scheduled request for blood samples because we're just getting the Quest thing finalized now. What will happen is for your scheduled visit, so the one year visit, um, we will, and we're trying to alternate data and blood samples at different times so that we're not burdening you as families too much. Uh, you'll get sent a kit uh, with instructions about where the lowest, nearest quest place is. We will talk to you on the phone to make sure that this is all gonna work. You'll go to that quest site, um, uh, get the blood drawn and the stuff will be shipped to us overnight. Um, for skin biopsies, currently we're limiting that to participants that, that um, come to see us clinically at OHSU because we um, are obtaining those skin biopsies. Uh, you know, it's a bigger deal to get a skin biopsy, although kids scream when they're pinned down. <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll get back to that. <laughs> okay. Sue so has to run over to Pecan right now. Um, so the, um, the skin biopsies, they have to be handled in a very, very specific way. These get, um, what happens to a tiny little two millimeter skin biopsy, which is about as big as the lead of a pencil, is it gets um, processed in a very specific way. We can then grow those cells, um, basically immortalize them so that we have a store of cells. You can do the same thing from blood, certain blood samples. Uh, where you have a, a sort of a store of cells that is not absolutely infinite, but almost infinite for future use. Now, you asked the question about how those get shared. As people request samples, we will uh, distribute those samples. 
We uh, prefer that it be a scientifically rigorous and vetted project. Um, we have uh, shared samples with people whose science we don't feel totally great about, but if they um, abide by a certain set of principles, we will share samples with um, most researchers that, that approach us. There's a little bit of paperwork that has to happen um, that's required by our university called a materials transfer agreement. Um, we do ask that the accepting um, researcher cover the cost of things like shipping and retrieving the samples, um, processing them to get them ready for shipment, but those are pretty modest costs. Um, and so, and we've been, um, over the years, we've always shared samples with people. So I think there's been some uh, chatter, rumors, that OHSU doesn't collaborate with people and doesn't share samples, but our record speaks otherwise. Um, and as I said in the BPAN um, sort of private session that we had, or the limited session that we had, whatever that day was, two days ago, yesterday, <laughs> it's all blurring at this point. Um, the gene discovery actually came about through exactly that kind of mechanism. So we had been um, seeing patients with brain iron for many years. Uh, in our clinic, we had been collecting data and samples in a repository, and we had a group of patients that we recognized had similarities one to the other and they didn't look like some of the other NBIA patients that we followed. And they also didn't care, have any of the genes that we were able to test for at the time that we'd found. And so, and each one of them was one child in a family. So we went into this really not knowing if it was a genetic disorder. Now that's a pretty big leap of faith. We kept those people in our repository we got data, samples, invested time, money that was unfunded projects uh, for many, many, many years. And then we had this, we recognized at some point with the Stratter's help <laughs> um, that we had a little tiny collection of people who all looked one like the other. They were all adults because they came to us with brain iron. That's why people came to us. So they were all adults. And it was through a project that was funded by NBIA Disorders Association. And Patty, remind me, was it Alliance funding as well? No, no, that was, was before the Alliance. The NBIA Di Disorders Association funding a small grant to a very young researcher, like the ones you've seen here today, who uh, was coming on the scene just as whole exome sequencing was breaking onto the scene. And uh, it was a very exciting time in genetics. I make it sound like it's 20 years ago, but in reality, it's actually only a few short years ago that whole exome sequencing was available. And so it was a collaborative effort. We had these patients phenotyped, what that means is they were very, very carefully described clinically. This is what they look like. This is what their clinical history is. This is where, how they started in childhood. This group of patients all had intellectual disability. They all had um, some seizures in childhood that they grew out of. They all developed brain iron at some point in their course, and then all of the people that we had as adults had experienced this deterioration, this regression in mid to later adulthood. And so we sent samples and data from those individuals to this young researcher, and it was just 13 people. And we found the gene in a matter of weeks. And that came about through unbiased research that was funded by NBI Disorders Association with no real knowledge that we were gonna get anywhere. It was kind of amazing. So, you know, it's a, I'm putting in a plug here, a shameless plug for research to proceed in an unbiased way. I know that there is a move because there's more bee panners now than any other group in the NBI Disorders Association, and you guys could splinter off and form your own group. 
but this has come about because of the whole, because of the whole group uh, choosing to stick together and say, you know, if, if the pecanners, and I, I, that sounds a little sort of offensive to call people bee panners and pecanners, but it's a shorthand way that we've gotten into a habit, which may not be such a good thing. But if the pecanners had said, hey, we know what our gene is, we don't want any of our money going towards funding something that isn't pecan related, bee pan would still be undiscovered, I believe. And so, you know, I'd put in a plug for us to be open to unbiased research projects that are not just disease specific because we find, we, we find things that benefit other diseases. And so um, I think research into MPAN is going to benefit BPAN, for instance. I think there are similarities in between those two diseases. Um, so we do share samples. We always have. We always will. Uh, we've had, I think, two instances where we have drawn a strict line under collaborating with particular researchers who have had unethical practices, in our opinion, who have abused their role. And so I think that's happened twice in Susan's 30-year career working on NBA. So. I had just one more question. Is yep. there any benefit to looking at umbilical cord blood tissue and samples? Yeah, we're asked that periodically. Um, I think that there is benefit to, and, and this probably, you should get multiple opinions <laughs> about this. Um, if there is an option to uh, bank umbilical cord blood, I think that that's something that uh, is worth considering. You have to realize that every sample that we commit to, we have to do an assessment of, you know, what is the, what is the cost of doing that? And I'm talking about financial cost, but also resources. So you guys may have noticed that during this meeting for the first time, we were collecting dried blood spots. These are those little filter papers. So when your child got their blood drawn, you may not have even noticed this, but the, the part of blood that was in the tube at the end of the blood drawer, after the blood's delivered into the tube, there's a little bit left in, in the catheter, the fla flexible plastic part and we dropped that onto dried blood spots. These dried blood spot filter papers are the ones that are used for newborn screening. We have no idea what we're gonna do with those, but there is um, really a very, very long experience that largely has come out of the California newborn screening program and actually Oregon's newborn screening program too, that tells us exactly how to store dry blood spots in a way that preserves them for optimal future use for a variety of things. And so when we build a repository, we have to go into it with a sort of an open mind and try to think as broadly as we can, but also balance that with resources. So, you know, obtaining and storing umbilical cord blood is, um, you know, not something that a lot of people have access to. Most laboratories charge quite a lot of money. They charge an annual fee to store it. Um, and it's, it's not always something that we can take on. But if parents want to do it, because, you know, uh, cord blood is considered a source of stem cells in, in certain settings, then, you know, we've told parents that if they want to do it, we'd encourage them to, and to we, we will log it in our, in our database that cord blood is available for this individual or this individual's sibling. Who knows what it might be useful for? That's, what, that's the nature of repositories. We don't always know. How am I doing on time? Just shut me up when you want to. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Okay. If a BPAN patient might accomplish a healthy mitochondria, uh, could it be possible to reduce the effects or hopefully to stop the disease? Say the first part of the question again, if they have healthy mitochondria? Yes, that's right. If 
would it be possible to do that? Um, well, I don't think we know quite enough at this point. So I, tell me a little bit more about where your question's coming from, and I, I might be able to answer it better. There are, uh, like, supplements or... Oh, I see. So for mitochondrial, those so-called mitococktail, those kinds yes. of things, is that what the question is uh -huh. about? Right. So should I take things that might make my mitochondria healthy? Correct. Yeah, so this is a question that we get asked for all of the NBIA disorders and actually for a lot of different disorders. Um, there is something called a mitococktail which um, is used for, and it, it's a, a bunch of uh, different kinds of supplements, um, many of which are available, if not all, are available as over-the-counter options, but um, they are of some proven benefit in people with known mitochondrial disorders and very specific mitochondrial disorders, and because of that, the question comes up all the time where sick mitochondria are implicated in other diseases. Should we be putting people onto a mitococktail? I, I have to say that I don't think that there's um, enough data right now to say convincingly whether mitochondria are super sick in BPAN. Um, you know, the autophagy problem that you've heard about here uh, there's a subset of autophagy that specifically involves the mitochondria that's called mitophagy, <laughs> but it is sort of under that larger umbrella. And I think we just uh, don't have quite enough information at this point to know whether the mitochondria are truly sick, whether they are just sick as part of the larger cell being sick, um, whether they're sick at all. But what we say to people is if to, for every thing that you are considering doing is to sort of take the following into account. Consider the evidence. We don't have a lot in this case. Consider the cost and the burden and the risk. And the cost is not simply financial. That's where cost and burden, I think burden is probably a bigger, a better word because burden may be financial, it may be practical, it may be, um, you know, so for instance, uh, you know, if, you, if there's a drug that requires that you have your blood drawn every single week and there's no evidence for it, is that making the burden too high for a person? In this case, the, the cost is not insubstantial. The cost of these supplements is not that low. It can get to be quite pricey for families. It's not usually covered by insurance. In fact, it's almost never covered by insurance for a disorder like BPAN where there's no data. And um, so we are, but on the other hand, from a risk perspective, the risks are probably quite low. So if patients want to do it, if families want to do it, we don't, you know, wave our hands in horror, but we just want them to go into it with eyes wide open. Risk is probably low. No real evidence at this stage because we don't know enough and consider what the burdens would be for your particular family. That's what I'd say. We're open to, you know, alternative therapies very much so. In fact, Oregon's famous for it. <laughs> We're, we have a, um, something called Orchamind at, at OHSU that's called the Oregon Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine in Neurologic Disease. That's what that acronym stands by. We have a College of Naturopathic Medicine, a College of Chinese Medicine, both in Portland, and so it's a, sort of a hotbed of alternative medicine options. Meg is circling, which makes me think she might want me to stop talking now. Well, we can certainly keep going. We have about 15 minutes left in this session and then a 15-minute break. We wanted to reserve some time for us as families to talk as a group, so um, if there aren't any more questions, we can transition to that. Sound good? One more? Okay. And I'll try to be less long-winded. How about that? <laughs> I, I do circle. <laughs> if Meg comes up on the stage with a big hook. Um, periodically, <laughs> we have um, 
notices that there is funding for research. I'm wondering how researchers learn about these grants, short of someone coming forward to them. A the reason I ask is we have a good research facility in our community, and I keep sending it to the department head, and he keeps saying, well, do they do this? And so anyway, I, that's my question. Yeah, so we've tried, it's actually, a, it's a very good question, um, because I think we are interested in bringing people who are interested in autophagy into the field. And so the NBIA Disorders Association does a very good job of disseminating it, as does the NBIA Alliance, which is a sort of the European, actually it's more than European, I think, Patty, isn't it? Um, but the, the kind of conglomeration of NBIA Disorders Associations, they do a really pretty good job of disseminating it to what has now become a fairly substantial uh, mailing list. And um, where for some grants, for some particular disorders, we've tried doing direct outreach to specific researchers that um, you know, we, we know are active in a field but may not have particularly looked at this field um, and sort of said, hey, we want to make you aware of this grant opportunity. Um, I think we need to find better ways to draw uh, individuals who are working on more common diseases and have them see the wisdom of working on single gene disorders and the interplay between common disease and rare disease. Um, that is, we've, our own group has tried now I think we've now got our third grant in front of the Michael J. Fox Foundation for one of the NBIA disorders. Um, they fund Parkinson's research. I mean, it's a little bit of a flip question, but we've gone to agencies that fund common disease to try to point out the ways in which our diseases are related to those common diseases. Um, it's not been a successful strategy the last two times we've tried it, but we're quite hopeful about this grant that is in front of them right now. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think we're trying through conventional mechanisms. It goes out to most universities, which is where, in reality, most of the researchers are. Um, and I, I think word is spreading. And then publications, I think people start to get excited about it. So 